The Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Takabura Tai, has stated that Boko Haram and other terrorist groups operating in the country cannot be defeated by warfare alone. He said that religious organizations in the country must come to the forefront of this spiritual battle. The Army Chief noted that the focus of the religious groups would be to address the ideologies which fuels terrorism. Still with me here, Nobel Obasi, thank you for staying with us, and of course, Emeka Mwadioke, both legal practitioners, thank you very much for coming. All right, what is your opinion of this? Do you agree that we need to look for another way to fight terrorism and this should be through ideological revolution? Let me use that word. Uh, yes, I think um, there's merit in what the Chief of Army Staff uh, is saying to the extent that um, most of these wars, uh, terrorist, uh, terrorism basically is fueled by um, ideologies. You can call them new ideologies. For instance, um, you talk of maybe promoting uh, an Islamic state. The other one talks about of whatever. So at the end of the day, you see that most of the uh, terrorist uh, activities are rooted in these uh, ideologies, some of them very worrisome. So I think basically what he's saying is that, and again, you, you discover that is also some of them are offshoots of doctrines within the Islamic uh, religion. So um, if you now have a mainstream um, ideology that, you know, of course, every uh, Muslim believes in and uh, keys into, and you now have some of these offshoots that are probably um, more violent, so to speak, uh, that says that Western education is, uh, is bad, like uh, Boko Haram ideology. Then um, I think there's them merit in him saying that um, um, religious leaders uh, should begin to look at this and then begin to teach their adherents on the proper way to go, and then also begin to oversight their adherents to, to, to ensure that they don't get you know, pulled into some of these more violent uh, doctrines. I think basically that's uh, how I understand what he's saying. Therefore, it's like saying you want to snuff off the, uh, the, the taproot from which these people you know, get their Adherents, and if they don't have adherents, of course, uh, the, 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 the fight and the ideology will ultimately die. The other question is should the army be the body organizing such a meeting? Isn't it the place of the government? Because some people are arguing that it shows a sort of weakness on the part of the army because we know them to deal with physical force, intelligence, not spiritual warfare, which is practically what the name of that meeting is. What's your take on that? Okay, thank you. So I can, I can relate with the thoughts of the you know, commentator about the fact that uh, the military are not supposed to be, uh, not supposed to be, uh, not supposed to be the, uh, the body organizing. to organize a, a, a religious warfare. Yeah, because uh, I mean, uh, the, the military are seen as people who are quite disciplined. They are seen as people who are very tough, you know, tough hardened, you know, battle ready, you know, gun, gun tooting and, and the rest. So, I, I I share in that sentiment. Then uh, then again, if you, if you look at it this way, perhaps they they they, they really try their possible best to make sure that they deplete insurgency and they they realize that okay this is how we can deplete this insurgency you know because they are those people who are at the front of the who are, who are always at the battlefield so i think the more obviously they would have caught you know so many insurgents and perhaps put it, put them to uh interrogations and they have realized that to get these people to get them off insurgency that perhaps they need to go back to the roots. And the root is through indoctrination. And indoctrination is through their religion. And they are going to integrate with the churches in terms of religious warfare. I don't think it's really a wrong step. Even though people might see it as being, you know, as being perhaps being weak, being like a weak, of 
they, they, they might see it as um, like a weak attempt of, of the military, considering the way people you know see them. But I think it's because of what they felt, what they've seen out there. They, 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 they realize that the church is more of a place where you can you know where you can easily uh, convert the insurgent, convert them, and rearrange, rearrange their mind into how it should be done, so that they don't really you know get to that point where they go on bombing places. When we talk about ideology, let's not forget the nature of Nigeria that we have today. First, we have a multiplicity of religion, and then we have ethnic groups, and then we have all sorts of, you know, groups in this country. How can we find the right ideology? Let's not forget that these people are, the people they are targeting are vulnerable people. And then we have, we'll come to the issue of poverty on its own specifically, because that's a key factor. But how can we find a narrative that will echo with the right people? Uh, it's, um, for me, uh, although I don't know, I want to believe that um, just like he hinted anyway, maybe it would have been better organized by a kind of independent uh, organization, but it's also maybe a kind of strategy to put a real spotlight on it, if it's coming from the army itself, to maybe show that level of seriousness. If it's uh, organized by an amorphous uh, association, maybe it might not have that traction. But um, to speak to the point uh, you made, um, it's, it's a bit um, uh, difficult, but at the end of the day, uh, there are several different religions, so it's about messaging. So you, you may probably have a different message for the Islamic religion, a different message for the Christians, a different message maybe for the traditionalists, and things like that. But I think the objective will always be the same, which is to ensure that fewer and fewer people get indoctrinated into some of these uh, more violent uh, uh, aspects of uh, whichever religion. Uh, I think that's, that's the, the... Can the religious goal. leaders really provide the appropriate narrative, considering a lot of persons will say they were key to bringing us to where we are today? Because it is some of the passionate, you know, commentary and ideology that they put out there that compelled some of these, you know, dogmatic followership that eventually led to what we have today. So are they ready to provide that kind of, you know, narrative that people can buy into? Yes. Yeah, so from yes, I think the the religious leaders, I think they are they are quite they are quite ready to provide the narrative, because if you so you see so many people who practically uh you know channel their lives in the way of their religious leaders. So these guys, these religious leaders, they they have overwhelming influence on their followers. So I think they 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 they, they are they are more suited you know to perhaps change the narratives because. You see, a religious leader can, that can come to come the pulpit and you know tell his followers that see these things that you guys are doing, you guys, I think this is the wrong way. You should I think that you guys are going through the wrong path, you know? If you follow this path, I think that's the right path. You should go. So the religious, so the religious leader, they are always putting themselves out there. I believe they have the capacity in this country to change the narrative in terms of these insurgents, because their words carry weight on their followers, or rather some of their followers. Okay. And again, more fun, uh, also because uh, the doctrines of these uh, terrorist groups are rooted essentially in uh, religion. Because, for instance, ISWAP is talking about an Islamic state. Um, like we hinted earlier, Boko Haram is, uh, is more or less another variant of it. And you even recall that uh, in August 2016, the they, they, they had a split, uh, given that the ISWAP thought that Boko Haram was more like the hardline uh, aspect, uh, dealing with the hardline aspect of it, even killing you know, uh, those who they feel are not uh, following their path. But ISWAP came and uh, they were seen to be probably more lenient to the, the captured territories and all that. So all these uh, ideological divides, uh, I think essentially that's what they're trying to target by saying if we are able to get more uh, religious leaders to speak to their people, their believers, and uh, win them off 
some of these other more violent doctrines, uh, probably the war, because at the end of the day also, um, just like the chief of staff hinted, um, defeating terrorism is, is, is holistic, it's going to be holistic, it's not about um, the brick and mortar aspect of carrying guns and all. So the ideological aspect has to be in place. The uh, intelligence aspect has to be in place. You know, uh, even all these identity issues, your customs, and so it's going to be holistic. Otherwise, you may win on this side, uh, like they say, win the war, uh, win the battle, and lose the war. So, I think, okay, uh, let's talk talk about the issue of poverty. Um, a lot of uh, pundits have uh, expressed the opinion that people that are poor tend to be more susceptible to these ideological indoctrination. And they are saying that maybe religion is the problem. Can you envisage a society that will be receptive to the idea of an ideology where religion does not, you know, some sort of religion does not reign supreme? Let me bring that question to you. Uh, a society where religion doesn't reign supreme? Because uh, a lot have said religion is the problem. That is where we got our problem. And then you were talking okay. about further ideal, um, changing the, using ideology, a yes. narrative that yes. would, you know, be more. What if yes. that narrative brings up problems that we can't foresee? So they are posi positioned in their thoughts that, is it possible for a religion-free Nigeria? Is that an idea that is even receptible to you in the first place before you think it through? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, well, there's the saying, just like you hinted, religion is the opium of the poor or the masses, whichever way you look at it. And it will probably always be. Uh, because, of course, when you, you don't have food to eat, you don't have uh, all the, uh, you know, frustration and every uh, other thing. everything is lacking, probably. Uh, you pray, begin, you just lie down, pray to God. <laughs> That's probably your only other hope. So, uh, that said, um, religion plays a critical role in every society. You know, it has its uh, therapeutic effects and uh, and all that. So, um, at the end of the day, uh, I think uh, having created the problem, so called, uh, it probably may also the the, the, the seed of the of the solution so may also be, be in the, the the problem that. Uh, created it. So, uh, why not? All right. Uh, before we wrap up this segment, tomorrow is Nigeria's Independence Day. 59 years of existence. I want to ask your thoughts. Let, let me start with your take to Nigerians as we celebrate 59 years, especially when it comes to the security aspect. Okay. So, I think um, a 59 years old human being is quite mature. And a 59 years old human being uh, to an extent should, should have you know, witnessed all the goods and bad of life and should have known how to manage his life properly. So Nigeria at 59 with these security challenges we, we see in here and it's, it's, it's not welcoming, it's disheartening to, you know, to, to, you know, to, to see that happen to our country. That, 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 that not to say other countries other countries do not have um, security challenges. Challenge. They, yes, all the countries, they do have security challenges, but some, to an extent, have been able to nip it at the board, and, you know, some, to an extent, have been able to curtail it. But Nigerian uh, security challenges is, is, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's I, I, I don't want to say it's, it's, it's cancerous this time around, but I just want to say it's, it's so... Do you so see a light at the end of the tunnel? Well, 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 yes, I do. I see a light at the end of the tunnel, and I okay. So for that light to come to the end of the tunnel, all hands needs to be on deck. The federal government they have to be well intentioned on what they, of, on on or how they want to tackle the security issues. I mean, they they, they 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 need to make sure that the right people, the right leadership are there. At, excuse me, are there on the at, at the military side, and they, they they need to make sure that they are supplying these guys with good weapons, and no one is shortchanging each other. And they also they need to make sure that. From the side of the insurgents, they create an enabling environment to take these guys off. Because like you rightly said about poverty, poverty is actually one of the reasons why you see these insurgents. Because I, I cannot envisage a well-fed somebody, you know, carrying a gun and going to the bush to say he wants to attack people and, you know, commit all sorts of atrocities. So if we tackle that poverty, it's fundamental. 
in tackling security issues. All right, I have to interrupt you and allow you just a, a minute, please. We're out of time. Yes, basically, um, um, Nigeria at 59, um, I guess we could have done better, a lot better. And um, the security challenges, they are not insurmountable. At the end of the day, if we have the, the right governance approach to all the issues, uh, especially rule of law, if everything falls in place and there's rule of law, and uh, people's rights are respected. All the uh, uh, citizens are, you know, accorded their rights. And, you know, fundamentally, like I said, the rule of law, because don't even forget what started the whole issue of Boko Haram. It was the extrajudicial killing of uh, Mohammed Yusuf. So you see that everything is rooted in rule of law. So the earlier the government and all its operators start you know, keen into the rule of law, the better we are. And at 60, we'll probably uh, be singing uh, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, well, we shall see about that. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Very appreciative of your time tonight. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. So much. And thank you for staying with us. We have had a very interesting conversation so far. However, it is not over. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, I will be giving you my take. Do stay with us. The Nigerian army has arrested a suspected Boko Haram insurgent logistics supplier and seized a car stacked with motorcycle used tires in Bonu State. The acting general officer commanding GOC 7 Division, Brigadier General A.K. Ibrahim, made the disclosure while parading the suspect at the Gubio Super Camp in Maiduguri. He said the suspect, Samuel Chukudon, was arrested on September 27th by a joint team of troops of Operation Lafia Dole and personnel of the Nigerian Customs Service, NCS, while traveling along Baga Munguno Road. Ibrahim said the troops seized items, which included a car, 136 used motorcycle tires, 200 new tubes, and a number of rubber gum. I'm here to present to you an arrest made by um, members of the Nigerian Customs and troops of Operation Lafia Duli of a Passat Jetta car with, uh, driven by one Mr. Samuel Chikudong. In the vehicle, we recovered about 136 used machine tires and then uh, over 200 brand new machine tubes and of course some other packets of rubber solution that can be used to you know repair the the tires now why we made this arrest is because there has been a ban on the use of motorcycles in the theater because of the security uh, challenges we are facing and the fact that uh, uh, we know that the Boko Haram terrorists make use of machines in moving for operations. And that was why the decision was taken. Nobody is allowed to make use of machine. And this man was arrested with these items heading towards the Lake Chad region. Now you know in that area, the Boko Haram terrorists are active around that side. And uh, uh, we feel there is something fishy about this. That is why we made this arrest. He also attempted to bribe our men when the arrest was made, and even while being interrogated, he made several attempts to bribe the men. So we are going to burn these items because they are not supposed to be where they were found. The Nigeria's government most visible response to a group whose recruitment and training lay important emphasis on the radicalization of our members is the fire for fire approach. It doesn't seem to be working for us. So I agree with the chief of army staff that warfare alone cannot win the insurgency fight and that there is a need to embrace an ideological attack. Not in the religious sense, though. I would rather naively submit that we play down on religion in this country. Wishful thinking, right? Anyway, if an ideological shift is achievable, the poverty and other multi-dimensional problems of our country present the challenge of finding the right narrative that will speak to the most vulnerable prey and that is strong enough to counter the message of insurgency. If you know of such, Please share with us.
Thank you for watching the program tonight. It returns same time tomorrow. Please join us again. See you soon and happy Independence Day celebrations.